So, thank you for those that are in the room uh, attending the, the second panel of the morning. This is the open forum on uh, local contents, how to incentivate, how to um, make sure that the local content will have their role in local languages, their role in, on the internet. Uh, this is an open forum that has been co-organized by EBU, by WIPO and UNESCO. And we have um, some distinguished guests that can go in this hour uh, trying to um, give us best practices and uh, uh, appropriate solution to this problem. Uh, as you know, we are in the UNESCO, that is the house that is trying to define the internet indicators. Um, these indicators that uh, you have seen have as, as one of the main healthy criteria to define where an internet is properly functioning, the quantity and the quality of local available content and services in local languages all around the world. Because the problem that we, have, we are facing today is that the internet is a platform where already existing vehicles can go very fast and can reach everybody, but where it's difficult to have um, local vehicles that can circulate even inside their own markets. Um, the reason behind we partner in this is because as EBU, the broadcaster, as you know, traditionally they have their own um, network, they have their own access to the citizens, so they don't pass through intermediaries. Uh, and in the, in the broadcasting world, there is a tradition of pro local production of contents that is the one, uh, the main reason for the success of the broadcasters in the relationship with their viewers. Now with the internet, there is a shift uh, in um, of, um, habits of con consumption and this tradition of the past is um, challenged because new tools of distribution are coming on and when it comes to the distribution of the internet on, of the, on the internet of broadcasting contents, for instance, we have to go through gatekeepers. And these gatekeepers can influence the way the contents are accessed and distributed. So it's important to see how the model of the past that they've worked in um, other world, like the, uh, the traditional media, the broadcasting, the printed media, etc., can be uh, the successful one in the past can be exported in, into the new world. Uh, to discuss this, we have um, a distinguished set of panelists here. I leave them to present each, uh, themselves, each one. Starting from Paolo. Do I start myself? This is Paolo Lanteri from Copyright Law Division at the World Intellectual Property Organization. I'm Danielle Klisch. I work for UNESCO. I'm in charge of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions Department. Alain Moudou, uh, Vice President of DIFA, which is a distribution company for African content, and Media Consulting Group, which is a consultancy based in Paris, specialized in cinema and television. My name is Gonzalo Laguado Serpa. I represent Proimagines Colombia, an organization uh, that promotes the film industry in my country. Okay, so these are the panelists. The, the mix is try to cover uh, a wide range of um, things, uh, as you can see. And I would like to give the floor first to uh, Daniel, that probably can explain some that there is a background needed that is the international treaties. When, uh, when it comes to the internet, that is something that is going beyond the frontiers. Please. Thank you, Giacomo, and uh, good morning to everyone. I'm impressed, Giacomo, this is already the second session for today. I know you've already started talking about these issues very early this morning. What I wanted to give is a sort of framework for our discussions today to talk about an international law that was adopted by UNESCO member states in 2005 and which was uh, entered into force in 2007 very quickly after its adoption here, and that's the uh, UNESCO Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Now, why was this international law um, adopted? Why was it considered important? Well, at the time, the uh, member states of UNESCO, the governments of UNESCO, said that 
the right of governments to support local content production were under threat. There were cases that were taken to the WTO court, which said that investments in film production, um, uh, uh, fixed book prices, um, cultural policies to support filmmakers or um, broadcasting programs were anti-competitive and should not exist anymore. So this was the reason for this law and it states at the very beginning simply that governments have the sovereign right to support their creative sectors. It seems such an obvious idea, but at that time it was really something under threat. Today, 146 governments around the world, including the European Union, which is uh, unusual for European Union itself as a body to ratify an international law like this, have uh, ratified the convention. In um, 2018, I've left outside for all of you here, a copy of uh, the executive summary of a report that we've produced on the impact of this convention. So it was ratified in 2007 and we're already now able to see what type of change that this international law is producing. It's not just a piece of paper. There's an active civil society, there's an active community of professionals working in the creative economy around the world that is using this as an instrument for change. And the global report is showing that, of course, in order to ensure media diversity, in order to ensure media uh, freedom, it requires policies to strengthen domestic production and to achieve a balance in between local content and imported content. It also shows that national content quotas um, of both public and private media have been able to enhance diversity of cultural expressions in at least the 90 countries around the world that have employed these content quotas. <coughs> Today, we know that we're facing a new environment with this international law, and that is the digital environment, internet governance, we see that uh, the digital revenues in the music market are growing exponentially and that this is caused by streaming in the recorded music market. As a result of this and other statistics I could cite, but we don't have much time, so I'll leave you to look at the report where there's a lot of statistics. It says that governments, even in the digital environment, should maintain this same right, because this also is not evident. Today, UNESCO is working with different governments to help them to introduce policies and measures that cut across what we call the value chain. So it's not just about investments in creativity, but also investments in production, distribution, and access to diverse cultural content. And this mixed approach, which involves actors from across not only the government, but across the society. It involves the, the professionals working in the industry, talking with the officials making policy to be able to have a successful outcome, which is our goal is to promote diversity of cultural expressions, including in the digital environment. Now, I just wanted to share with you an example of how this can work. So in Colombia, this is one of our uh, countries where we've been working a lot the last years. We saw in 2003 that only four films were produced. Four. In that year, there was a new cinema law that was passed and it took this, what I just talked about, this integrated approach. It introduced not only a law, but a production fund, financial incentives to encourage to encourage uh, film distribution, as well as tax incentives to encourage investments in the film industry. A few years ago, in 2016, the number four turned into the number 41. So we could see a 10 times increase in the level of uh, films produced 
in Colombia over that period of time. We also saw there was a doubling of the number of visitors. So there was a local consumption that also skyrocketed, which proves or shows that, that uh, diversity of cultural content, which nowadays also includes local content, is something that is wanted, is a good investment. It's not just there to support principles of diversity, but it can also have important returns. Today, UNESCO is working with um, a new digital platform in Colombia called the Retina Latina. It has been uh, supported by the fund of the convention, the International Fund for Cultural Diversity, and its goal is to expand this approach to diversity and content production to other Latin American countries by creating a free on-demand uh, streaming system for the distribution of films from Latin America. We're curious, and our colleague here on the panel will tell us, about a new orange economy law that was passed just last year, and we're curious to see how this is actually going to impact how this work has been done over the last years to invest in policies, to use international instruments for the benefit of increasing uh, local content production and diversity of cultural expressions. Um, before I, I end, because I think I have just five minutes, I don't want to talk too much, is to draw your attention to some publications I left outside. One is the summary of the global report, but the other are uh, guidelines that were adopted by the 146 countries I talked to you about earlier about how to promote diversity in the digital environment. And these guidelines include everything, including electronic commerce and the trade of uh, digital cultural products and how it encourages governments to introduce cultural causes in their trade agreements to ensure the uh, exchange of such uh, cultural goods and services. The guidelines are, are, are outside, and this December, and I invite you all to come back to Paris in December, the week of the 11th of December, where the Intergovernmental Committee, so all the countries that have uh, signed this law, ratified this law, will come to Paris together with over 100 civil society organizations and professional associations to talk about what are the priorities for the implementation of these guidelines. And one of them will obviously be the how we can work together to develop and implement innovative policies to uh, support this diversity in local content production. So I look forward to uh, hearing any questions you have. And um, thank you very much. And the question we gathered at the end, if you, if you don't mind. So the next um, is Paolo, that as you have listened before, is from WIPO. Please. Yes, good morning, everyone. So the World Intellectual Property Organization, as you, you may know, is a specialized agency of the United Nations with 191 member states. We are a demand-driven organization, so our activities both on the norm setting side and uh, um, on the capacity building and technical assistance side are driven by our countries and our member states. And once more, here we are at the IGF, uh, partnering with uh, EBU, UNESCO, and uh, many other private stakeholders, bringing local content on the agenda, bringing content again on the agenda on the IGF. Since uh, um, Giacomo forgot to mention, uh, I, I think it's important to remind ourselves why do we put so much stress on the content. Because like it or not, content is the main driver making people go into the internet on a daily basis. Being it a, a movie, being music, being news, being uh, literature, being uh, uh, news of the day. So we want to remember that to ourselves each time we speak about content at the IGF because we believe content should be kept at the center of any internal governance uh, policy discussion. Today we add another layer of, discussion, of complexity because we're going to talk about local content, local in terms of uh, language, local in terms of uh, cultural relevance and perhaps place of production. That con this content is uh, 
on a constantly high demand, because we will always need uh, local content, but on the production side and on the offer side, we uh, face some more uh, challenges. And uh, one of the objectives of this session today is actually looking at what are the challenges faced in local content production and distribution, and wh what, what could be a viable solution or initiatives in order to boost that production. WIPO is operating in different ways in this area, but I think I can uh, uh, classify our main activities in two areas. One is creating uh, uh, a level playing field from a regulatory perspective, a norm setting perspective with our countries. Uh, this is broadly intended as international treaties in the field of copyright that we implement and we administer and at the same time we also facilitate discussion and negotiation with new norms. So what are the main characteristics of the international legal framework and what is the link with local content? So the international legal framework provides, first of all, economic incentives, some basic uh, economic rights that are considered uh, essential incentives attracting investment because you, well, uh, you can well understand how, for instance, uh, um, educational publishing uh, or uh, news reporting, leaving aside the uh, audiovisual sector because we have uh, several speakers that would uh, tackle uh, those issues, would require major investment, professionals, uh, technical capacity, a lot of time and a lot of money. We need to provide economic incentives in order to have this content produced. Another element that is uh, often uh, forgotten and oversighted in this forum is that the international legal framework also provide moral rights, recognition, in terms of uh, attribution of being recognized the author of a certain creation. This is actually, in my view, a very important element for local content, and one that plays an important role even in those cases where content is created without any commercial purpose and is often forget, forgotten. Finally, I want to give um, a sort of uh, initial analysis of what is the impact of copyright protection on access. We, access to knowledge is a very popular topic at the IGF and in other four as well for very good reason. And there is this uh, sort of mystification saying that copyright protection actually hinders access to knowledge. I think this is not the case for a number of obvious reasons. First of all, people that are devoting their lives in content creation have all the interest in distributing that content and being heard, being watched, being listened by the public. Secondly, we have many examples of viable business models where public can access content that is protected, valuable, for free. This is the example of public uh, uh, broadcasters where the incomes are generated through advertisement and other business models. Then on the internet we have a growing number of services where we have access to an unprecedented repertoire of content for a fee, which is not unreasonable, I guess. And on top of that, the system provides for ample flexibility in terms of exercise of economic rights plus limitation and exceptions that are uh, taking into account the broader interests of societies such as news reporting, educational purposes, or, or the interest of people with disabilities. So actually, incentivizing creation of content uh, has a very positive impact on the further access to it. Uh, we're not saying that the system is perfect. In fact, our countries are constantly negotiating and discuss discussing possible updates and modification of of the legal framework. Uh, in this specific context, I can, I can provide two examples. Uh, member states have been discussing for over 20 years now the possibility of updating the protection of broadcasting organization uh, against uh, signal theft and signal piracy. And another very important uh, project that is uh, uh, currently undergoing uh, in Geneva and comes from a proposal from Latin America is a request for a deeper analysis of what works and what doesn't work so well on the internet uh, in terms of copyright. And uh, that proposal uh, goes into the practices about the role of, new, of the platforms, uh, who, uh, what is the 
the share of the revenues and who keeps what and, uh, and many other very thorny issue that I'm sure will gonna give uh, us uh, work for the next few years. Uh, on the side of the norm setting, WIPO is also uh, deeply engaged uh, in technical assistance and in supporting uh, our countries. Again, on a demand-driven basis, we have been receiving a growing number of requests for assisting countries specifically for boosting local content production. One example, very successful example, was started a few years ago in the context of the CDP, the Committee on Development and Intellectual Property, the so-called Development Agenda, was called Strengthening the Audiovisual Sector in Africa. Some of the partners of that project are present in the room, so perhaps in the Q&A they, they can make intervention. That was a project very practical, looking at trainings, we were looking at what data were available, uh, what was the feasibility of boosting uh, the awareness of how the, the system would work, we would look also at management practices. From that original project that was implemented in Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Morocco and Senegal, we now have a number of new projects that are going to, will be discussed next week in Geneva. First, we have a request from Africa, Burkina Faso, to do the same for the music sector. Secondly, we have a broader and much more related to the internet request from Latin America, from Brazil, to dig in what's happening in the audiovisual sector, in the audiovisual platforms in Latin America. What are the movies watched by Latin American uh, uh, cost customer? Who is producing those movies? And who is keeping the money out of the monetization of those movies? And finally, we have a, a very interesting project coming from Kenya that is trying to look at how software and mobile ap application can be boosted and produced locally. It's only partially related, but in fact, through apps, we are distributing a lot of local content as well. So from, to conclude, I think from observing these factors, on the one hand, uh, the trends in norm setting, on the other hand, uh, the constant uh, request received by member states for technical assistance in this specific field, we can sort of highlight three elements. Uh, on, first of all, there is an appetite and a growing awareness of policymaker of the importance and the strategic importance of local content. Secondly, we have to admit the issue is very complex. There is no one solution, it's not enough to raise the protection or provide the tax incentives to actually boost local content production. And finally, we're not here to, to say that the copyright system is a panacea or a magic solution, but certainly it's fair to say that it's part of the solution. A sound and balanced system is required and needs to be combined, matched with, coupled with, by other policies, other initiatives, other incentives, like the one we just heard from UNESCO, and that we're gonna hear about from the speakers that we brought here, that will share with us uh, what they've done in Africa and Latin America, and what are the results coming out from this endeavor in boosting local content. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. So, to follow up, I think that um, the best is I think give the floor now to Gonzalo Laguado, that um, is one of the successful examples that we can listen to. It was mentioned either by UNESCO and uh, also from WIPO. So, Gonzalo, can you share with us? Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Paolo. And thank you, Danielle, for your excellent introduction on the Colombian system. <laughs> Um, like I said earlier, I represent an organization called Pro Imágenes Colombia. Um, we were created in 1997 by our Culture Act for the specific purpose of nurturing and promoting our film industry in Colombia. So over the course of the past 20 years, we've been setting forth various legislations and policies on our film industry. Um, these instruments, rather than being separate and disjointed, comprise a unified uh, system com composed of tax incentives, cash rebates, disbursements for local production, and other elements that interweave and form a single framework that has allowed our industry to flourish. Uh, to most of you, I think that Colombian cinema is known for 
the movie Embrace of the Serpent, which was released in 2015 or 16, but nominated for the 2016 Oscars for the category of Best Foreign Film. <laughs> yes. Um, it's interesting because this movie was a beneficiary of one of our funds, which is called the Film Development Fund, created in 2003. Uh, just ex before explaining what the Film Devel Development Fund, the FDF, is, uh, let me share some figures with you that Danielle has already introduced, but still. Uh, the FDF so far has disbursed $31 million to local film productions and $12 million to other projects target, targeting education, research, and distribution. The, the number of released Colombian feature films has also uh, increased greatly, as Danielle mentioned. We went from five feature films in 2003 to 44 in 2017. And the number of admissions for locally produced films has multiplied from 2 million in 2004, maybe, to 4 million in 2017. The screens and theaters for the exhibition of films have tripled as well, from 462 in 2007 to over 1,000 in 2017. So in short, there is more access, there is more production of local content, and there is more delivery of local content because of this. And the way we did this uh, was by eliminating a set of taxes that were levied, levied on, 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 the, on cinema and that had nothing to do with the film industry. And we replaced that with a small parafiscal tax that uh, the FDF collects through Pro Imagines. Uh, we also created tax incentives for investors because by investing in a Colombian production or co-production, you can apply for tax deductions for up to 165% of that investment from your income tax. All this to say that uh, by doing this, we made tickets more affordable. We created an autonomous source of financing for local productions, and we attracted investment. The FDF system is meant to be a virtuous circle. Low-cost tickets facilitate access to film culture and increase admissions. By increasing admissions, we create collections from the, for the FDF. The more resources the FDF has, the more financing local productions have, and the more local content there is to distribute. Um, of course, this progress has also resulted in the creation of many jobs for the film sector. This, this is where another piece of legislation is important, and that is, that is the um, 12, 2012 Columbia Filming Act. And this is nine years before the FDF, mind you, so we had already made great advances in stimulating production and access to local content, so we had other targets in sight, and created another fund, the Columbia Film Fund. This fund operates a bit differently because rather than dis dispersing resources to producers, what it does is offering, it, it uses a cash rebate model. So production companies that film in Colombia are provided with a cash rebate for 40% of the expenses paid for film services and 20% of expenses for food, hotels and transportation. The first season of uh, the uh, Netflix series Narcos, which I'm sure you, most of you know, uh, received a cash rebate from this fund. <laughs> Uh, so the purpose of this fund, Columbia Film Fund, is to attract foreign productions and to have them invest in our local film service providers, and in that context to boost local employment and to promote our, film cont uh, our country as a desirable filming location. Uh, this purpose, I believe, was also, has also met uh, great success. Uh, to make a long story short, I'm going to refer very briefly to the last fund that we created, which is the New Media Fund, which is... Uh, we partnered with the Ministry of Telecommunications, with the Chamber of Commerce, and with the Canada Media Fund to create a fund that is targeted at audiovisual and cross-media uh, content, specifically designed for digital platforms. Uh, that being said, um, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to elaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. I think that. Very, very interesting. I think that the third um, fund you mentioned is exactly uh, the bridge that we were looking for between the old world and the new world and uh, is exactly in line with the discussion we are having here. Um, before to give it the floor to Alain Modo, uh, just a word. He, he was supposed to be here with um, the Secretary General of the African Broadcasting Union, Grégoire Njaka, but unfortunately he has to be today in Abidjan for an important meeting on sport rights that uh, for, for him is more <laughs> urgent 
than the perspective of the internet in the future. So, um, but uh, Gregoire Njaka, with the support of EBU and with Alain Modo as um, main coordinator, we're working on, on a project to enhance uh, production capacity in the audiovisual and exactly in the internet world uh, in for African partners. The floor is yours. Thanks, Giacomo. Uh, yes, there is a huge need of uh, local content in Africa uh, because for years this uh, continent has been fed with uh, telenovelas and I, I believe today that uh, it's time to provide to African uh, viewers uh, and African citizens something different than telenovelas coming even from uh, Colombia or from uh, Venezuela or other Latin countries. Um, when I've been launching DIFA uh, five years ago, this was my uh, the bet. This was uh, what, what we wanted to do with an African partner, Jean-Louis Hernancam, who is sitting in this room. And we tried to uh, put together African content coming from any country from Africa made by African directors or made by African producers to promote this content not only in Africa but outside Africa. Today, uh, DIFA uh, is representing 132 uh, producers and directors from uh, 30 countries of Africa, not only French speaking but also from uh, English speaking territories and even um, Portuguese territories. Uh, language. So, the market in Africa is really booming. We are expecting more than 1,000 broadcasters by the end of 2020, not only terrestrial, but also satellites. Uh, there is a huge number of uh, local broadcasters in, in different countries who are now existing. This is the case of Ivory Coast, where now there is more than uh, 10 new broadcasters. Uh, there is a huge boom of internet platforms like video on demand, subscription video on demand platform, more than 150 platforms in Africa today. And all these uh, platforms, the channels or internet platforms, need local content. In addition to that, there are very few theaters in Africa where films could be released even if there are a small change today in some African uh, French-speaking territories, uh, thanks to groups like uh, Bolloré, who is investing in new um, theaters, mainly in capital city. And there are countries where there are no theaters, or just one is in the capital city. So it's uh, very difficult when all these um, film producers are working today to, to release their movie and to, to get the return on of their investment. So uh, what we are looking to try to establish a new framework where local content providers like pro independent producers <coughs> will be able to find first uh, some funds to produce this content and secondly to establish new uh, business models where broadcasters, African broadcasters can reach this premium high quality content. Because today, in Africa, uh, uh, on French speaking territories, there are two big broadcasters. One is Canal Plus, and the second is it's a pay TV, and the second is a TV5. And all these two broadcasters are just keeping all the rights, all the premium content that all the, f the um, uh, local broadcasters, public or private, are not able to get. And this is, of course, pity for um, the African viewers. So what we try to do today is to answer certain needs uh, uh, to help the production first, and secondly, to help the distribution of this content. So the needs, uh, what we have in mind with uh, EBU and uh, ABU, the African uh, Union of uh, Public Broadcasters, is to put together all uh, these um, broadcasters around the table to do something which is which was useful uh, used to be years ago that put together the resources to buy or to pre-finance content. Even a small uh, public TV uh, in a small African country can invest uh, his little money, uh, 100 100 dollars per hour, for instance, but all together when they are sitting around the, sa the same table talking with us for the same 
uh, theme, theme series, or theme program, these broadcasters could leverage uh, some other funds. These funds could be advertising because they are representing different territories which are very interesting for uh, advertisers. It could be also money from public uh, foundation like uh, Bill Gates Foundation, for instance. If you are, uh, I know that there are some series talking about uh, VIH or any uh, other disease who are supported by um, this kind of foundation and who need to reach the citizens, need to reach the people in their countries. And only the public television are able to cover 100% of these territories. So this, uh, this new platform called uh, Hub, uh, African Hub will be able to uh, provide to investors uh, the territories where they want to reach uh, the audience will provide to the, to, the, um, to the producers the capacity to raise money not only from the public television but also from public funds like uh, ACP which is a, a European uh, fund which is not open today but which will, which will open uh, by the end of the year. It, it will be also possible to, uh, to create some sort of basket fund where money from uh, Agence, France, Agence Française du Développement or the Goethe Institute in Germany or other public um, institutions can invest money, being sure that the investment will be really done in the best way, best quality, transparency, uh, and high quality. So this project is not uh, today established because we are of course working uh, on it uh, at this moment. Uh, but we have a strong basis of that. We know that many advertise, advertising companies are interested because when you come to them and say, oh, I have uh, 10 countries for this series or for this uh, program, they immediately think about their uh, potential market. It's also the same for uh, foundation like uh, UNESCO or all these who are supporting um, uh, edutainment they are interested by having the most, uh, the, the most, uh, the biggest number of territories to this, uh, for these movies. And of course, it's also interesting for these broad, uh, public broadcasters, African public broadcasters, because they will be able to provide to their audience the strong and high quality content that they will not able to have at this moment. So uh, this is very interest interesting because all this content could be also uh, put on internet, there are, as, as I said, 150 uh, video on demand platform in, uh, on these 54 uh, African countries, and all these internet platforms are looking for content, so it will be another possibility for the producers, independent producers, to, to make return on, on their investment. Finally, to join what they have been, what was, what, what was said before me, we really need also uh, a legal framework because many independent producers in Africa are investing their own money uh, in these movies and it is very, very difficult to recoup. And we need uh, to have a strong uh, legal system. We, we need to have a strong public uh, policy uh, to support this, um, this sector. And we need also um, uh, more cooperation between all these pan-African bodies we are existing and who are not really involved today from my view uh, in supporting the, the um, film industry or the content industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. <coughs> so, um, I would have also my presentation, but I will not do because uh, if not, we will not have time to, for the floor. Um, now, questions from you for the speakers. I see many, many persons that are directly involved with these items uh, in their daily work, but they are shy for the moment. <laughs> okay, there is one that is not shy. Please, if not, I will make my presentation and then it's over. You should do your presentation. Though. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Jorge Vargas, and I head partnerships for emerging markets for the Wikimedia Foundation. The Wikimedia Foundation, it's the nonprofit that supports and operates Wikipedia. And uh, as you may know, as soon as you Google something, usually the first or second result is a Wikipedia link. But unfortunately, and this is why I think this topic is very relevant within the context of internet governance, there's a lot of content that is missing, uh, particularly in local languages, right? So 
pretty much the job that I do in emerging markets to find partners that are interested in supporting our mission of uh, finding the sum of all knowledge, but not just all knowledge, but in all languages. Right now, Wikipedia is available in over 300 languages, but um, usually all of that content is in language or French or Spanish and not in languages that are relevant for many local communities. So um, within the work that we do, uh, we try to identify partners that uh, want to help uh, not just identify the local content that is missing, but also uh, create it. So uh, my question for you all and for the panel is, how do you find ways to identify what is the local content that is relevant for the people that are interested in? Because oftentimes we fall under a bias where we think that certain content that is relevant for us in the West or for certain uh, specific characteristics of people should be the relevant content for certain people in the field, but unfortunately sometimes that is kind of like a mismatch. So um, is there any mechanism that you think should be utilized or that you're utilizing to identify what content is relevant for the people in, in these parts of the world? Thank you. Okay. If I may try to answer to this, then I give eventually the floor to other. Um, broadcasting industry is relevant because is able to provide to local viewers what they are asking for. The more is successful a broadcaster, the more it means that he can intercept and answer to the needs of the viewers and the local uh, population. Of course, Wikipedia, it's in a very specific part of the needs of the population, but of course, I think that um, looking for what already exists is, is the best way because the, you know the, there is the know-how, there is the experience, and there is the expertise. The problem is that people from the broadcasting doesn't feel that they are involved in the internet until now, and people on the internet, they don't look at the broadcasting and traditional media world. I think that the interaction would be the best and the shortest way to, uh, to uh, cross-fertilize the, the environment. But any other comments from the panel? No? Okay. Second question? Well, just one little comment on, on this question, I, I think, and what we are seeing in, the, in Brazil, who are uh, uh, developing uh, internet uh, network communities is, is not to trying to find what is relevant for, for those communities who are building a, a network, but try to give them autonomy to decide what is relevant and this may stimulate a production based on their own uh, references. This is quite important for, for the, this important question that a colleague has, has done. But I'd like to have, I, I have one, um, one comment and one question. Well, in Brazil, we were starting the project of open CDN the idea of open CDN is, is to deliver content via internet exchange points uh, to regions of lower internet activity. Let's say activity is, uh, we, are, we are measuring in terms of internet traffic in our internet exchange points and number of ISPs, number of autonomous systems in, in the specific regions to stimulate local providers to deliver uh, content. Because uh, uh, the, the content delivery, it, it's very costly. It it's costs a lot to develop an infrastructure of servers to deliver content in some regions. It's very important to providing the infrastructure of for, for the content to, to get there and, and then stimulate providers to deliver content and, and create uh, what would be a competition in this area. Because I, um, I mean, there are a lot of, of objectives that this, this uh, policy uh, 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 try to address, but uh, one of them is that we believe that it may contribute to the diversity of the content because if 
you stimulate the, the, the internet providers market in some region, you may find providers uh, that would deliver uh, content in a special segment uh, that are uh, desired by uh, specific groups in that region. And, but we don't have a study on that. Then, then we, I think we could do a study looking for the impact on the production of the content and not only on the, the, the stimulus of, of the market, of the internet provider, uh, internet service provider's market. Well, this is the comment. I mean, the question is... Very short because we have to close. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, is there any research showing that small content productors are making their projects viable uh, via intellectual property rights. I'm, I was curious about uh, this, this idea that uh, internet uh, intellectual property may provide for small artists and musicians and writers uh, a way for them to make their project viable. Uh, yes, I, mean, I think we can hear directly from uh, a wide variety of people that are directly engaged in production and creation of content. I think if you are asking whether there is a study that shows that uh, directly, probably there are a number of studies on that I'm, I'm happy to discuss, but it's, it's enough really to, to talk to the people that are involved in that. If you are a small movie producer in a small country in Latin America or uh, in Africa, how would you go about monetizing your uh, upfront investment on the production without uh, the possibility of controlling the exploitation of that creation? There are no real alternatives unless you get funds for the creation from a public uh, source, which is not really a viable solution, a sustainable solution in the medium long term. If you look at uh, individual first row creators and uh, perf performers, perhaps this, the situation is slightly different, but in terms of authors, their main income comes from the fact they can control their own creation. It's true that in order for them to make money, they will need to transfer it up from, I mean, immediately. So often they will not be the copyright owner down the line. So this is the perception that the industry owns copyright, but there is a reason for that. Because as an individual creator, you need to transfer to make money out of your creative effort. And then there is an industry that is well organized to exploit it. On the side of performers, the people are not creating and just interpreting existing uh, creation. Perhaps there, there are cases where, since the protection of performers is not truly really global, uh, and in many cases, perhaps they live out of uh, live performances and one-off uh, monetization of the fixation of the performance. But still, the fixation of the performance is based on related rights. So my answer is that there is different from each right owners. But yes, in terms of uh, practices and licenses, and when you look at the money they, they are making, it's mostly through uh, licensing of copyright. But perhaps here we have producers, we have many other comments that want to say something. Please, and uh, be short because we have to leave the room quite no soon for others. Good morning, everyone. My name is Enyi. I am here from Lagos and in Nigeria and work as a, a producer um, fin raising financing for, for films and TV and different things. And um, it is a cross section of comments uh, that were made today about just different pockets. And it's, it's interesting because in my space where, first of all, I have a country of I'm, uh, over 100 million people with maybe honestly not 50 cinemas in that in that space so there's so, so much room for expansion i think that there's a need to rethink the way we go about um one producing content who we make it for and how we're going to exhibit it and then how we're going to distribute it i think there has to be a rethinking of how it becomes economical for everyone um we can commoditize and monetize this monetize the situation but if in my country alone once again with less than 50 cinemas it's on record like a, a picture like 
an international picture like Black Panther did nearly $3 million in that market alone during the time of its cinema release. So there's definitely a potential there to make product that is interesting and viable and probably people will come. But for to expand out, there's also a need to rethink how we do this expansion because to retrofit a cinema in my, in, my in my country costs maybe somewhere around a million dollars to do. The unit price for someone who's making a certain um, standard of living cost is not viable for them to pay upwards of $10 or $15 to come watch a picture. So how do we rethink the exhibition situation? How do we make it cheaper to build up and out? And how do we make it affordable for a consumer to come and enjoy and experience the product? Um, and for monetizing from a producer standpoint, if I live in a country, once again, with 40 cinemas, and I'm, that number is doubling to 80, it just expands. I don't necessarily have to make any more, or rather, it doesn't have to cost me any more to make the product, but then I expand out with the possibilities of war, how much I can make from the product. So there's a, there's a whole ecosystem that needs to be rethought I, and not copied, but rethought for the particular environment. And I think it goes for other emerging markets as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to close. There are two questions. They are the last ones, and then we close. Please, very short. Yes, my name is Wesley Gibbings from the Caribbean. Um, there can be a lengthy preamble to this, but I'll get straight to the point. I see the, that there might be space for fiscal incentive as, a, as an inducement to support the industry, um, but my question has to do with the other side, which is this notion that one can regulate for positive discrimination with respect to local content. And my question is, how anachronistic is that? The other question, please. Forgive me, I was not here from the, from the beginning of the discussion, but uh, and I, I'm not aware whether you talked about this before or not, but I was really surprised to hear that the, there, there is just one way to uh, extract value from content, and that is to sell your content and uh, to have the rights on that. Did I get it right? Because there is a lot of uh, there is a whole lot of, of economy and a whole um, let's say uh, universe of content uh, which is uh, licensed under Creative Commons, uh, and uh, there are people uh, making uh, making money out of out of uh, licensing their content with Creative Commons, and also there is this movement of uh, free software which uh, has uh, created a whole new discussion on the prevailing economic mo model in our, uh, in our uh, era. So uh, I'm not aware whether you discussed about this or not, but uh, this is something really important to, to consider. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, I think, I'm not sure you were here when I was presenting, but I made uh, uh, a point about the flexibility of the system and definitely Creative Commons and open source software are a way of exercising economic rights, but are not alternatives to the copyright system, are just a way of exercising economic rights. And uh, we organized a similar session last year at the IGF, and one of the main examples I brought to the fore was actually Wikipedia, which is a great platform enabling access to local content, and I'm fully aware. We, I come from an organization that actually licenses all its new works with Creative Commons, so absolutely, it's, it's part of the, of the puzzle. In this specific session and towards the end, we were b talking about uh, audiovisual productions, which I'm not aware of any viable model of audiovisual production that are based on open licensing, but perhaps I'm, I'm wrong. And we were using the examples we have on the panel. But I fully take your point, are very important models and at least for software development are probably the emerging model like uh, open licensing, absolutely. Uh, just a few figures to, 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 to explain. We have been launching last year a movie uh, at the same time on internet with the uh, Lagarda Group and uh, in some theaters in Africa. The movie is an anim animated movie made by an Algerian producer called Tales of Africa. It's a beautiful movie. We have big, big success, very big success on internet with more than 700,000 views. And uh, for 
all these years, the producer received $2,000 with 700,000 views. At the same time, the film was released in eight theaters in major uh, African uh, cities, uh, Western Africa, and we had about 15,000 um, tickets sold, and the producer received $500 from these um, theaters. So it means that it's a huge, diffi difficult market for, uh, for film producers or content producers in Africa. I can add something, for example, the best, in 2017, the best movies uh, in Ivory Coast was called L'Interprète, and it was the biggest uh, hit, and they made more than 20,000 um, uh, tickets, and the, the producer win uh, more than 7,000 uh, euros for that. It means, just to conclude that, these figures that without broadcasters, without public money, and without advertising, there is no way to produce local content in Africa. It's not internet that will provide the money for the, for the content. Daniel, the word of the closing, because we have to leave the room. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, if there was no investment from the public sector, there would be no publishing industry, film industry, music industry. So, I mean, it's, um, it's quite a big thing. But what you're talking about in terms of figures, and somebody else asked earlier about studies, the problem is, is that we don't have comprehensive studies to be able to show. There's anecdotes. We've all heard them. They create a lot of uh, fear. They create a lot of um, anxiety. But what we need really are some hard facts. And we need to be able, if we're going to go forward, to be able to talk seriously about diversity of uh, cultural content, of local cultural content in the internet age. We need really to work together to be able to produce this data in order to inform the new models. Thank you. Thank you. Just a word to answer your question. Uh, no, it's not anachronistic. The problem is the purpose. Uh, the, the fiscal deduction at the moment works for big capital investment, like movie production. Uh, when it comes to the internet, we are looking for small sums to small, for small production. So the tax, tax incentive, until now, on my knowledge, uh, we don't have a, a model that works. But probably um, this could be invented. I think that um, all the things evolve if there is a will to evolve in a certain direction. And I think that what we want to discuss today here with this seminar is to say that it's possible to do, and we have to look at the example of the past, and to see how they, they could be modernized to answer to the same needs even in the future through the new platform and the new distribution. I uh, thank you everybody for being here, for being so patient and um, I uh, ask um, to, if you want to stay, the next panel here is uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles. Thank you very much.